Thank you, Steve, for such a warm welcome. Thank you, Mike, for your welcome as well. It's a pleasure to be here. And I, I thank you for, for coming out on a, this autumn evening. And I thank you for your time. And uh, this is um, a really important question, how science kills God. And it's, uh, it was an important uh, question for me growing up as well. Um, and as Mike has already um, described, the, the capacity of science to unpack life, even things that we thought kind of ended at a certain level of detail once the electron microscope was discovered, suddenly we discovered a whole new level of detail and were able to look at things in the world uh, at incredibly small levels. We're also able to probe the known boundaries of the universe and we're able to go to the, the depths of the sea and out into space as well. We're able to see inside the human body like never before. We now know the, the, the structure and function of um, every gene in the human body. We're in an incredible place where there's been such an explosion of scientific discovery uh, over the last two, three hundred years. And yet, um, Although science has had a huge impact, many assume that the discoveries and the practice of science are incompatible with belief in God. Many believe that science has removed the need from God, or that science, in fact, has killed God. And certainly, when I was growing up, I, I didn't believe, I didn't have a belief in God. I wouldn't say that I believed that science had killed God, but I, I certainly, I just assumed that it's either or, really. You either are a Christian or you, have, you believe in God or you're a scientist. Um, and I remember as a young child, maybe nine or ten, thinking, I was sitting looking out of a, a window on a rainy day and suddenly the thought came to me, why can I think? Why am I a conscious, breathing, thinking, person. And I was a scientist from an early age. I always did my maths homework first. I got very stressed about English and history and the associated essays. I went on to do science A-levels and I remember really looking up to my biology teacher and I can't exactly remember how it happened but we must have had a conversation um, and she ended up giving me a copy of The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. This was in the 1980s, so this book had just been out, you know, for a few years. And I remember reading this book and, and being, you know, reading that I was a genetic carrier. And actually that was my sole, kind of my pr primary purpose in life was as this kind of carrier of genetic material. And the purpose of my life is to pass that on to the next generation. And everything really can be understood through the lens of the fact that we are genetic carriers. And I just, I guess I just read it. I was 17 and I just absorbed it. And, and it affected my view of the world. In other words, my world view. We'll say a little bit more about that later on. As a young adult, I arrived in Bristol to study biochemistry. So not too far from here, um, I arrived to study biochemistry. And I think by that point, I again had assumed that science and belief in God were at odds with each other. And in the first week, I was invited to attend an event called Gorilla Christian which uh, has nothing to do with barbecuing, thankfully, um, but it was actually four Christians on a panel and you could ask them any question you want. And so I put my hand up and I, I was quite close to the front row and I said, surely you can't believe in God and be a scientist at the same time. And I was told something very simple and I think there's more that can be said, but, they, but the answer that I was given was, well, yes, you can. And I don't think anyone had ever said that to me before. I feel like I'd never heard that before in all of my life. And it got me thinking and it got me asking questions. It really set me on a journey. And after my biochemistry degree, I spent a year in pharmaceutical industry working for Novartis in Basel. And then, as Steve said, went on to do a PhD in brain imaging because I wanted to study something that I could see with my eyes rather than down a microscope. And, and then seven years of postdoctoral research um, in, in this area of brain imaging. And I had made 
um, two assumptions when I put my hand up at Gorilla Christian and asked that question. The first um, assumption that I had made was that science and belief in God were in conflict with each other. People either put their faith in God or in science, but not both. And therefore, we need to choose between them. And science is familiar and rational and demonstrable. Belief in God is irrational, unfamiliar, undemonstrable, and unscientific. Therefore, it's a no-brainer. I choose science. And I think I probably went through that thought process, whether consciously or, or subconsciously. It's either or. And this is an example of faulty logic, a faulty dilemma, where you feel made to choose between just two options, when in reality there are more options available. And the science and God conversation is littered with these faulty dilemmas, and I'll hopefully unpack some more of them as we go on. The second assumption I had made was that science has negated God. Science has killed God, if you like, because religion belongs to the dark ages. Science belongs to the modern educated world. And yes, when we didn't have me mechanisms and we didn't have science, of course we were going to offer a spiritual explanation for something. But now that we have modern science, God is no longer needed and is gradually being squeezed out from the things that we don't understand. Some people refer to this as God of the gaps. God fills the gaps in our knowledge until science uncovers it, and then we no longer need him. Let's look at this first assumption that I had made. The idea that science and belief in God are in conflict with each other. Well, the truth is that there are practicing scientists on both sides of the debate. I have here on this slide two such scientists. Francis Collins, on the left, is the director of the National Institutes on Health in the USA, the major US research funding body in the USA. Prior to this, he was head of the Human Genome Project. The previous head of the Human Genome Project was Jim Watson, on the right. And uh, he won the Nobel Prize, along with Francis Crick, for discovering the double helix structure of DNA in the 1960s. Collins is a Christian. Watson is an atheist. But they are both brilliant scientists. And what divides them is not their science, but their worldview. In other words, their view of the world. In other words, the spectacles, or if you like, the lens through which you view the world and make sense of the world. Now, people don't just wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to get myself a worldview today. You absorb it like I did as a child, having a question, why can I think? And then being given a, an answer, the reason you can think ultimately is to pass on your genetic material to the next generation. We absorb our worldview from the books we read, the magazines we read, the radio programs we listen to, the TV programs we watch, the news, everything. And we absorb and we form a view of the world. And there are two competing worldviews in the science and God conversation. And John Lennox, professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford and also a Christian, points out that the real battleground is between the worldviews of atheism or, if you like, naturalism, which says matter is primary, atoms and molecules have always existed, and mind is derivative from matter. So matter is primary and mind is secondary. Versus theism, which says mind is primary. The very first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning, God. In other words, the mind of God is first and has always, he has always existed. And then atoms and molecules and everything else have come from him. And these are the two primary competing worldviews in this arena of science. Well, where do we go from here? How do we 
weigh these two worldviews up and assess them? Well, it's worth asking the question, how is it that science is possible? This method that perhaps a number of you in the room are familiar with, the methods of science. You see, modern science seems to assume two types of ordering. Firstly, there is an order in nature. If you set up a study in the city that I'm from, in Oxford, and you know you're on to something, and you decide then to go to London and set up the same study in London, what should you find? The same results. It's, it's so obvious, really, we don't even think about it. It's just part and parcel of science. There is an underlying order to nature so that you can repeat studies, you can test things. Where does this order come from? A number of scientists who contributed significantly to the modern scientific revolution, people such as Johannes Kepler for his work on the planets, Isaac Newton for gravity, Kelvin for temperature, Gregor Mendel for his genetics, Francis Bacon, who is often referred to as the father of the modern scientific method. These men were all theists, believe it or not who believed that there was order in nature because there was an orderer behind it. It's almost the best kept secret of science. People assume actually the most productive scientists today are atheists and naturalists. It certainly was not the case during the modern scientific revolution. And C.S. Lewis put it like this, he said, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a law giver. In other words, God. There's an order to the natural world without which science would not be possible. And secondly, there's an order in the human mind. As human beings, we have a curiosity about the world, and right from infancy, we ask questions. I have two young children, you know, from about, what is it, about 18 months when they can start to speak. Why this? Why that? We are curious. We want to investigate and make sense of things that we don't understand, and we're able to think logically and rationally about the world. Where does this come from? A common belief today in neuroscience is that you are your brain, that all of your thoughts and feelings and emotions and experiences are simply the product of neurons firing. Francis Crick, who co-discovered DNA along with Jim Watson, said this. He said, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. You're nothing but a pack of neurons. How do you feel about that? <laughs> But this view, which is held by some prominent, very smart neuroscientists, deeply undermines the integrity of the very mind that they use to conduct their neuroscience. Because if our thoughts are reducible only to electrical and chemical activity, why should we necessarily expect the output to be rational and logical? Why should we expect irrational processes to lead to rational thought? Is that really the best conclusion that we can draw if we really think about it? Why on that basis should we trust anything that our minds tell us? Scientific, religious, anything. Professor John Lennox argues a different case. And he says, the very existence of this capacity for rational thought is surely a pointer, not downwards to chance and necessity, but upwards 
to an intelligent source of that capacity. You see, the theist would say, you know, many people assume that God, if he exists, is anti-intellectual, that if you want to pursue a thinking career, if you want to pursue a, a career which involves using your mind, you need to leave God at the door. And if you want to engage with God, you need to leave your brain at the door. Nothing could be further from the truth. You see, the theist would say that actually science is made possible because the order in nature and the order in the human mind can both be traced to the same source, a rationally intelligent being known as God. In other words, you can make a case that God is the one who makes science possible because he is the source of the order in nature and the order in the human mind. And Richard Swinburne, Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at the University of Oxford and one of the foremost philosophers today and also a Christian, he says this, and I've got more in my quote than is on the slide. Note, I am not postulating a God of the gaps, a God merely to explain the things that science has not yet explained. I am postulating a God to explain why science explains. I do not deny that science explains, but I postulate God to explain why. Let's move on to the second assumption that I have made, this idea that science has killed God, has moved God, squeezed him out. He is no longer needed. He is relegated to the gaps, and those gaps are getting smaller and smaller uh, by the day. This is another example of a faulty dilemma. People think they have to choose between two mutually exclusive alternatives, either a scientific mechanism or God did it. And this is a bit like asking somebody to choose between these two reasons as to why Microsoft Office exists. Either because programming languages have been invented or because Bill Gates exists. Choose. And you look at that for one millisecond and you say, we don't need to choose. We need both of these explanations. They're both valid reasons as to why Microsoft Office exists. In fact, if you just have the programming languages and leave out Bill Gates, you don't get a full understanding of Microsoft Office. You don't get a sense of the vision, why it started, why it was successful, and why it continues to exist and send us endless updates today. <laughs> Not only are these valid parallel explanations that pose no conflict to look at the underlying mechanisms and have a sense of unknown and even be in relationship with the God behind it, they, I believe, are both needed in order to fully understand the world that we live in. One without the other is an incomplete understanding. It sells us short. There is more to life than simply mechanisms. And we will come to that in a few minutes. One very popular example of um, the faulty dilemma that we sometimes face between choosing a mechanism or God is the Big Bang Theory. Scientists at the beginning of the 20th century uh, discovered uh, through a, a series of, of different uh, discoveries that 13.7 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into a singularity which then exploded and began rapidly <laughs> expanding to form our solar system and others. And some say that now that we know this, there is no need to invoke God as an explanation. But the thing is, the Big Bang may beautifully, wonderfully help us answer how the universe got started, but it does not help us answer the question, why does it exist in the first place? Why is there something rather than nothing? And I believe both explanations are needed. And why is there something rather than nothing, given the extremely improbable conditions at the moment of the Big Bang? 
philosophers and cosmologists refer to the laws of nature as being incredibly finely tuned or in intricately balanced to enable complex life. And there were a number of constants that were needed to all come together at the same time to yield the conditions that were necessary for this Big Bang to happen. One such constant is the gravitational constant. That has to be, um, if it's too strong, planets implode on each other. If it's too weak, just matter just, um, just gradually moves apart and planets can't form and, con and condense into, into actual planets. If the gravitational force changed by as little as one part in 10 to the power 40, stars such as our sun would not have existed, rendering life impossible. Just so you understand the level of accuracy of one, to the power, uh, one uh, part in 10 to the power 40, let me put it like this. Hugh, this is from Hugh Ross, who's a cosmologist. He says this, cover America with coins in a column reaching to the moon, then do the same for a billion other continents of the same size, paint one coin red, and put it somewhere in one of the billion piles. Blindfold a friend and ask her to pick it out. The odds are about one in 10 to the power 40 that she will. And that's just one constant, and there are a whole host of constants that were involved in these moments. I find it really hard to put that down to chance and say that it just happened. Really, if I use my brain as a scientist, is that the inference to the best explanation? I think that the existence of God is a very persuasive explanation for why there is something rather than nothing. And there's actually something very interesting. The Big Bang actually is an example of a recent scientific discovery that agrees with ancient scripture. You see, the very first verse of the Bible says this, in the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible says that the universe had a beginning. Modern science is saying the universe had a beginning. These two agree with each other. They're not at odds. And they both together are needed as an explanation as, why there, as to why there is something rather than nothing. Let's move on to the idea of scientism. Now, many scientists would view science as a really helpful method of looking at the natural world, but some want to extend it beyond that and say that science holds the answer to every question that we have. Or if it doesn't, eventually it will have the answer to every question that we have. And this is known as scientism. And this is more of a worldview, a view of the world that says, you have a question? Let's ask science. Let's ask the scientists. And we see, actually, that the, that the, the view of a scientist is taken as very authoritative in our, in our world today. This idea of scientism basically says that meaning is only found in whatever you can test and prove empirically in a laboratory. And uh, lots of people in the early 20th century espoused it and believed it. Um, one particular philosopher, Bertrand Russell, described it like this. He said, whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods. And what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. In other words, unless you can observe and verify something, it's, it's meaningless. Well, what can be said in response to scientism? Professor Lennox reminds us that at the level of language, scientism defeats itself. You see, the very statements used to define scientism cannot themselves be observed and verified experimentally. The definition of scientism is therefore meaningless according to its own terms. 
Professor Lennox says, how does Russell know this? Is the statement a scientific one? Has it been derived by scientific methods? It hasn't. And therefore, if, it, if its point is true and to be taken seriously, the very statement is meaningless. And so at the level of language, scientism defeats itself. Secondly, if we look at ordinary daily life, how much is there that we can prove? You see, there are lots of things that you and I have confidence in that are meaningful, but they haven't been demonstrated scientifically. If I ask you, do your family love you? You tell me, yes. And I say, prove it to me. Prove it scientifically. You would say, I can give you some strong evidence, but I can't prove it. I can't actually prove it to you that they love me. Can you prove that the news at 10 will start tonight at 10? Well, you can say, it's pretty likely. I can give you a probability because it has done for years and years, but I can't actually prove it. And can you prove that the sun will rise tomorrow? Again, highly likely, but not a foregone conclusion, and certainly not verifiable scientifically according to the terms that Bertrand Russell intended. There is actually, when you look at life, there's very little that's meaningful that you can conclusively prove. And believe it or not, even science doesn't offer proof. Many subatomic particles, such as the Higgs boson, this particle that some poor PhD student in Geneva is trying to figure out by reconstructing the conditions at the, the beginning of the universe, if it's ever observed, it cannot technically be seen and therefore verified because no sooner has it formed, it reacts to form something else. And this is the case for many subatomic particles and we can't prove even that these particles exist and yet we know that they do from other observations. This perception that science offers us proof is a, a common one but it's really a misnomer and those of you that are scientists or that have spent time in science will know that that's simply not the case. Scientists speak of probabilities, they speak of likelihoods, they talk about the inference to the best explanation with the available technology that we have today, knowing that if the technology improves or changes, we may have to, we may draw new conclusions about this. Even science doesn't offer proof. And so it's worth asking, really, can science answer all of our questions. I believe that science can answer many questions, but it cannot answer every question. And as the late uh, biologist Sir Peter Medua said, the existence of a limit to science is made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions having to do with first and last things. Questions such as, how did everything begin? What are we all here for? What is the point of living? Science cannot answer all of our questions. And ultimately, science can't answer the God question. It can't help us answer the question of whether or not God exists. But that doesn't mean it's not a valid question. It simply means you need to look outside of science for answers to that question. Let's move on to the area of miracles. I think this is another difficult area and another faulty dilemma. People think, OK, I can either be a scientist or I can believe crazy things about the world. And I can get so far with your idea that this person, Jesus, might have been a good teacher and might have said some things that make sense. But the idea of God meddling with nature 
is problematic for me and it interferes with my thinking as a scientist. It seems highly irrational. It seems in conflict with the scientific method. Well, I'd like to try and persuade you that miracles actually require science for their identification. And C.S. Lewis uses an example in his book, Miracles, which I will paraphrase for you. Imagine you um, went away, I don't know, somewhere down the road into the Cotswolds for the weekend, and you're in a B&B, and um, you're about to go out for the day, but you want to leave some cash in the room so you're not carrying too much around. And let's say you leave 50 pounds in your bedside table, and you go out for the day. And when you come back, there's only 10 pounds in your bedside table. What do you conclude? Do you conclude that the laws of mathematics have been broken? Or do you conclude that the laws of England have been broken? <laughs> it is precisely because the laws of mathematics are fixed and stable and reliable and repeatable that you are able to recognize there must be another explanation. Somebody must have come in from outside and done something. You see, miracles are not anti-scientific. They are not violations. You need to know the regularities of nature in order to know when they are temporarily suspended to do something extraordinary. You need the, super, the natural in order to recognize the supernatural. You need the normal in order to recognize the paranormal. You need science in order to recognize miracles. And it might be encouraging to you that one of the biographies of Jesus Christ was written by a scientifically minded person, a physician called Luke. And he said at the beginning of this biography that he has written a highly ordered account. He has carefully investigated everything from the beginning and has written down an orderly account. And he did that so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing you may have life in his name. And he records many miracles of Jesus, including healings, and people being raised from the dead, including the virgin birth and also the resurrection of Jesus himself. And you see, according to Luke, it is precisely because people do not normally get up from their graves and walk again that Luke recognizes the resurrection of Jesus as utterly unique in history At the heart of good scientific practice requires the scientists to be open to new ideas. The scientific method means you start with a hypothesis and then you collect data and you check the data against the hypothesis. If it, if it matches, you're on to something. Keep going. You collect more data. If the data doesn't match, the hypothesis. You need to adjust the hypothesis. You see, right at the heart of being a good scientist requires an openness to new ideas. And sometimes even science is hindered because of a lack of openness. We want to hold on to a theory rather than actually let, let the data speak for itself. I want to ask you, in this area as well, are you open to new ideas? Because if it is true that one person has uniquely risen from the dead, the one taboo, the one thing that we don't even know what to call it in our conversations, if it's true that one person has risen from the dead and says that if we follow him, the same will be true of us, then surely good scientific practices to test that hypothesis. Because if it's true, it changes everything. It's not just true for me, that's nice for you, you're happy, that works for your life. It's either true for all of us or none of us. And you see, if God exists, 
And if he has brought into being everything in this world, I believe he will be capable of establishing laws and trends that science uncovers beautifully. And also he will be capable of temporarily suspending those to do something extraordinary. And not because he's a meddler, but because the God of Christianity is a rescuer. He is a God who does not leave us on our own. He is a God that said, I will come down and look you in the eye and meet you in your situation and do something about it. I will rescue you. We can't fix ourselves. If there's one thing I've learned about myself over the years, I can't fix myself. And no amount of self-help books is going to get me there. I need help from outside. I need someone who is not like me. I need someone who is like me. They understand what it's like to be a person, but they're not like me. They don't mess up in the same way that I do. Only one person has uniquely met both of those criteria, the person of Jesus Christ who was fully man and fully God and who stepped into human history 2,000 years ago and lived and died so that if we choose him, if we follow him, we can know freedom, we can know life, we can know relationship with the God that made us and a God who goes with us into the laboratory. In fact, a God who is there already and welcomes us in and says, let's look at this world together. I just want to address one final area. Sometimes we think I can either be a thinker or I can be a person of faith, but not both. Because faith represents a retreat from the evidence. And Richard Dawkins described faith as the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in spite of, perhaps even because of, the lack of evidence. In other words, faith, if you want to exercise faith, you throw your brain out of the window and you take a blind leap into the dark and believe impossible things. Well, I would like to persuade you that everyone has faith in something, including scientists, and we always exercise faith on the basis of evidence. You see, a scientist has faith in the scientific method. Every time they step into a lab, every time they design a new experiment, every time you submit a new grant application, you're exercising faith that nature will continue to be ordered and the human mind will continue to be rational. Faith is not something that is relegated to the realm of religion. Everyone has faith in something, including scientists. We also have faith in daily life, and again, it's precisely on the basis of the evidence I enjoy running, and in the winter that means running in the dark, either at night or in the morning. And about three years ago I was out running, and to my horror, I um, tripped and I did a face plant onto the ground, and I landed on my chin just here. And I wasn't far from home, so ran home dripping blood, and my husband drove me to the JR hospital, which was just up the hill from where we live, and I was getting ready. I needed stitches in my chin. So I was in this little room, and um, the doctor was getting ready with the, the needle and stuff. And so I decided to chat to him, and I said, so how long have you been working here? Expecting him to say, oh, years and years. It's all good. I've done this loads of times. And he said, I'm just coming to the end of my first six-month rotation. And I thought, oh no, a junior doctor is about to sew my face back together. <laughs> what was my level of faith in him? It was pretty low. Why? On the basis of the evidence, here was someone early on in their training with not as much experience. Later on, a registrar came in and started to help him with some of the stitches. What happened to my level of faith? It went up. Why? Not on the absence of evidence, on the basis 
of evidence here was someone with more experience, had done more of these in the past and was more likely to do a good job. You see, faith in daily life, in science, is always on the basis of evidence. And it is the same in the New Testament. When Jesus walked the earth and people put their faith in him, that wasn't just a, uh, a leap in the dark. That was because they had seen a living, breathing, walking, radically different, incredibly powerful, some person that spoke with authority yet cared about people and seemed to restore dignity of people from the margins of society. He would bring them back into the center. He would bring hope out of despair. He would even bring life out of death itself. And they put their faith in him on the basis of the evidence that they saw in front of them. Evidence-based faith was what we read about in the biographies of Jesus Christ. It is the same today. Now, we don't have a living, breathing Jesus, but he returned to the Father, and he sent the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And that is what Christians mean when they say God is alive today, that actually God is active through the Holy Spirit in this world today. And we have the scriptures that talk about him, that if you want to throw them out and, and, and say that they're not reliable, you will need to throw out every other historical document, Homer's Iliad, Caesar's Gallic War, the lot. Because even historians that don't agree that Jesus was divine, they do believe that the historicity of the New Testament matches up and out outstrips any other historical document that we have. This idea that, uh, uh, that, that the Bible has been changed and it can't be trusted is simply not the case. And if you would like to look more into that, I highly recommend a book by my colleague Amy or Ewing called Why Trust the Bible. Where does this land us? You see, it is not the exercise of faith that is irrational in this world but whether or not there is good evidence to trust what our faith is in. We all have faith in something. We are all leaning into something. Is that working for you? Is there good reason to put that amount of weight on that one thing that you're trusting in? I believe that there is extremely good evidence to put your trust in the person of Jesus. He won't let you down. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And that was something that I discovered halfway through this degree in biochemistry in Bristol, having grown up not really knowing anything at all about the Christian faith, anything at all. And I asked lots of questions. I grilled lots of Christians. <laughs> I really did. And I didn't have all the answers given to me, but I felt like I got to a place where I had enough answers that this made sense. And actually, I believed that Jesus was, is real. And I decided about halfway through to make a decision to trust him. And that was a process. I don't think that was an instant kind of moment, although there were some key moments along the way. But it was really fascinating and incredible for me to return to my lectures, to return to the lab, not just knowing and discovering about the world, but actually knowing the God behind it, knowing his forgiveness, knowing that kind of offer of a new start, but also continuing to thrive as a scientist. It is not the case at all that science has killed God. You could argue he is the one that gives it its life. He is the one that gives science its life. That was what I came to discover. That was 20 years ago. I have never looked back. And so I want to end there. I want to thank you for your time. I think we're going to have a break now and we're going to uh, have some questions afterwards. So be thinking of things that you would like to ask. Thank you for your time. Thank you.